one of the first terms we always talk about when we're working in uh, 3D uh, technologies for creating movies and entertainment is this idea of how we see. Uh, the, the distance between our eyes is an extremely important thing. We call that the interocular distance. Um, the reason that's important is, uh, is a few factors, but primarily the distance between our eyes and for most of us grown human beings, it's roughly two and a half inches. The reason that's important is because it helps dictate the scale of everything we see in the world. So things that look big to us and things that look small to us are based on the fact that we have two eyes two and a half inches apart. They also, of course, give us the illusion of depth because we're seeing two different views of objects that create this illusion of depth perception. And of course, our brain is doing a lot of work. Now, in the sense of uh, working in 3D movies, uh, we have this situation where we have to basically simulate reality. It's really an illusion of 3D because uh, at a very technical level, what we're doing is creating a fairly convincing illusion of three dimensions from one vantage point. This isn't like a hologram where we can move around it. It's really a single vantage point. We take advantage of the fact that in movie theaters people don't walk around, so they don't see the artifice of the illusion so much. But essentially we have to use two cameras. Um, that would simulate how we see. Now you might think it's as easy as taking two cameras and putting them two and a half inches apart, uh, but unfortunately our eyes don't work like cameras. Uh, certainly our eye lenses don't work like lenses and our retinas don't work like uh, camera sensors. So we have to do an approximation. And we call the distance between the cameras this uh, uh, interaxial distance because it's a variable. Now, technically speaking, we rarely use cameras that are uh, side by side like this because uh, when we create the illusion of 3D, we're actually dealing with an interaxial separation that's much narrower than our own uh, interocular distance of two and a half inches. So oftentimes we're dealing with something down to about an inch. So we have these very complicated camera rigs that will allow us to do that. But suffice it to say the interaxial distance is one of the two very important things about creating the illusion of 3D. When we take two cameras and we photograph something, the space between them will dictate how deep the shot looks from the, the closest to the farthest object. So if we want more depth in a shot, we'll, we'll uh, move the cameras apart farther. And if we want less depth, we'll pull them together. Um, so that's part of the illusion. But at a certain point, if the cameras are too far apart, if you consider the interocular distance of a, an animal like a mouse with a very tiny interocular, objects that look small to us might look very large to them because of their scale and because of the distance between their eyes. And in fact, a lot of animals, their eyes are so close together to get uh, accurate depth cues. If you ever watch birds, for example, in a tree and their heads are moving back and forth like this and their heads are bobbing, they're actually using that as a depth cue to understand better how far away things are. Um, so when we're working with interaxial, if we consider the small animal like a mouse or a large animal like an elephant with a very wide interocular, we have this issue of scale we have to deal with. If we have two cameras that are too far apart, for example, if this is a condition called hyperstereo, we end up miniaturizing the subject matter. So you may have seen some uh, sporting events recently that have been shot in 3D. They tend to put cameras way up at the top of a stadium and they'll pull them really far apart to give you some illusion of depth. And in the process, it miniaturizes everything. So it looks like the Lilliputians just took up football. Um, <laughs> It doesn't look like they're far away. It looks like they're tiny people, which might be useful, you know, Gulliver's Travel 3D or something. But, um, it, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange phenomenon. And this happens a lot if you've ever used Viewmasters. As a kid, I was always fascinated with Mount Rushmore. I grew up in the wilds of Maine, and I thought, who would carve a mountain into faces? This is amazing. So my grandparents gave me the Viewmaster of Mount Rushmore. And in going through the photographs, I realized it looked very tiny to me. I thought, what, what's the big deal, you know? Well, as it turns out, they photograph it with two cameras that were really far apart to give the illusion of depth, and in the process, it miniaturized it. So uh, it wasn't a very useful thing. Uh, anyway, uh, when we work with uh, 3D cameras, the interaxial is one thing. That gives us a sense of depth. But if we take a look at those images in 3D, either on a monitor or on a screen, we have a problem with those images in that infinity is, rectified, is rendered at the wrong distance from us, the viewer. It actually shows up right at the screen surface, which means infinity is far too close to us, and all the objects tend to jut out in front of the screen. It's quite uncomfortable to look at. So we have to use this technique called convergence that would actually take that depth that we've dialed in with the interaxial controls and push it back into the screen to some reasonable distance. Uh, we do that in a variety of ways. Camera systems, we, we uh, angle them. But essentially, if you look at these lenses on a camera system, at a certain point in space, those points will cross, and that point we call the, the convergence point. So if we're photographing an actor, and we put the convergence point on the actor's face, uh, they will appear right at the screen plane itself, right at the surface of the screen, and anything in front of them will be in front, and anything behind will be behind. The reason that's important becomes much clearer in post-production, because there are situations we can create in 3D that can be quite uncomfortable to look at. You may have witnessed some of these on your own. Some are much more subtle than others. Um, 
the way we experience 3D is this illusion of two pictures, essentially, a left eye picture and a right eye picture that's creating this sensation of depth by slight parallax cues in those images. But in this case, if we do a lot of this convergence in the cameras, we'll end up with vertical distortion. You can see on the sides, the scale of things gets wrong as we tow these cameras in. And our brains are not tuned to accommodate for vertical misalignment in the images. Uh, our eyes work this way, not this way. So the horizontal parallax is what gives us this illusion of depth, but when we have a vertical mismatch, we have to fix that. These can be somewhat hard to look at on the eyes. It's a, it's a difficult phenomenon to correct in your brain, but it's a relatively easy thing to do in a computer, so we do it all the time. Uh, we tend to use a, a favorite technique that puts the entire process in post-production that has no distortion whatsoever, so we're not actually photographing with that distortion in it. We can fix that. Um, in this uh, case, you may be a little hard to see in the stage lights, but um, the convergence point, in this case, if you look at his eyes, they look like they're in focus. If this were a 3D image on a 3D screen, that would mean his eyes would appear at the screen plane. His arm would stick out in front of it, the wall would be behind it. Anything that looks like it's in focus to the naked eye without 3D glasses is the convergence point. And we take advantage of that when we're putting sequences together. Because of the way we see 3D, there's a phenomenon that we refer to as the vergence and accommodation um, in, our, in our visual cortex. When we see objects in 3D, there are two things happening at once. If you hold your arm out at arm's length like this and look at your thumb and you move it towards your face, two things are happening at the same time. Your eyes are rotating to follow the object in depth from you, but they're also adjusting their focus so that the, your thumb always looks like it's in focus, which is what accounts for looking around the world and seeing everything in focus. We're making this constant adjustment. However, the convergence, the angular rotation of our eyes, and the accommodation, the focus, are inextricably linked. There's no reason for those functions really to be separated. However, when we're creating 3D, we are creating an illusion of 3D. We can create a situation where we have what we call a vergence accommodation conflict. Uh, this is an important thing to understand because this is the basis of why 3D can be uncomfortable to look at sometimes. If I'm trying to create the illusion that there's this red orb that's floating out in front of the screen, what's going to happen is your eyes are going to converge at this point in space as if the object were really out here in front in space. However, because the illusion of 3D is created by projecting an image onto a flat surface behind us, your eyes are going to converge here, but they have to focus way over there. So these two functions are now separated, which can cause some eye fatigue because your eyes are having to do all of these gymnastics. You converge on it, and then you have to shift your focus. I think it's probably easiest in movie theaters because you're sitting still that you become accustomed to the focal distance that you are from the, the focus distance from the screen. So you can accommodate that a little bit more quickly, but it's fatiguing on the eyes. So we have to use this convergence control in a post-production situation to control the amount of vergence and accommodation conflict so that you don't end up with a headache. It's the kind of thing that if we didn't honor this in post, after three or four minutes you'd be fine. After 30 minutes you'd start to rub your temples. After an hour you'd have a splitting headache and you wouldn't know why. Um, in 3D, we talk a lot about parallax, and I'm going to blast right through this part. Uh, suffice it to say, negative parallax refers to anything in front of the screen on the viewer space, and positive parallax is anything inside the screen. As I mentioned, we're creating the illusion of 3D by two pictures, a left eye picture and a right eye picture. So if I'm trying to create the illusion of positive parallax, an object that's floating inside the screen plane, then the object in the left eye is shifted to the left of center, and the right eye would be shifted to the right. So left to the left, right to the right indicates positive parallax, an object away from us behind the screen. Uh, the issue of negative parallax, something in the audience space, is uh, created when the left eye object starts to move towards the right, the right eye object starts to move towards the left. We also have a situation that we refer to as zero parallax, where the object might appear right at the screen surface. And that essentially, like in that illustration of the, the man's eyes, uh, if those objects appear at the exact same point in the images from the left to the right, then they will appear right at the screen surface. Um, now, there's a condition that can be created in this illusion of 3D that's unintentional and quite painful. Um, it's called divergence. Um, I can't even think of a creative use for it, to be honest with you, but maybe there is one. Um, this is a situation if I'm trying to render an object at infinity. and uh, I have the wrong camera settings, which unfortunately is easy to do if you've never done it before. You can actually create a situation where in order to fuse those images into a three-dimensional uh, object, your eyes have to rotate outward. So normally if we're looking at a great distance, our eyes are parallel, and anything closer to us, the, our eyes tend to converge. But in a situation of divergence, I can create a situation we call <laughs> walleye, where your eyes have to rotate outward. The way it would look to the naked eye, this would be an overlay of a left and a right eye image, which would not be a divergent situation. And if you look at the fingertips of the object up there, that's roughly the distance between your eyes. So that would render that object in, if you were seeing it in 3D, which you won't right now, um, 
that would appear that that object is roughly at infinity from us. But the condition of divergence can create a situation like this that's nearly impossible to look at because your eyes would literally have to rotate outward to see that figure on the left. And unfortunately, again, it's too easy to create. And the biggest problem is you won't see it on a small monitor, which is typically how we work in movies. You have to just know this is a phenomenon based on magnification and scale. So if you're working on a television monitor for feature film, you can create this situation and not even know you've done it until you go to a movie theater and look at it when it's way too late to do anything about it. Now, uh, in 3D, it's really interesting to note that we have, uh, a lot of these folks have mentioned, there are, are cues that we use to indicate depth. Typically, we refer to those as monocular depth cues. And here's just a few of them. But these are cues that largely will clue us into what depth is when we don't have the advantage of seeing with both eyes, or stereopsis in this case. So you'll see here's a quick list of things, motion parallax, relative and familiar size, perspective and vanishing point, texture gradient, and lighting and shadow. Uh, some quick examples here. In this case, motion parallax, if you look at this animation, it should be relatively clear to you that the, uh, the camera is moving, but the objects are not moving themselves, which would indicate to us that one of those objects, the one on the left, is probably closer to us. Now, it would also indicate, if it really is closer to us and it's moving faster, it must be smaller but they do look like they're the same size. So in 2D, we can, uh, we can actually fool our brain a little bit. So here's an example of that. In 2D, here's a representation of two objects that look roughly the same size. But if I just move the vantage point of the camera, I can see that I've actually created an illusion here of forced perspective where they're actually very different sizes. This only works in two, in two dimensions. In three dimensions, the artifice is, is revealed quite easily. Um, also, when we talk about relative scale, when we see objects, uh, for example, in photographs, you can make an assumption that objects are a certain scale based on things we know, things that are familiar to us. So in this case, a man and a car, those are two relatively familiar objects to us. So we have a, re a rough idea in our head, or a fairly precise idea, actually, of the scale of these objects. But now, if we start playing around with images like this, what does that mean? Is that a small car, or is that a big guy? You know, in 2D, now we start to play with this notion where we don't really understand what's going on there. It requires further explanation or examination. Uh, of course, in three dimensions, we would see all that. Now, uh, another cue that we use, monocular uh, depth cue, is this notion of perspective. And certainly, vanishing points uh, like this, you can, your brain will tell you those squares are probably the same size, and they recede into the distance, so that must be farther away in the background. And that car is smaller. And there are certain tools and techniques that we use when we're creating, especially in 2D, we use this um, illusion of uh, limited depth of field um, where we limit the focus in the frame to direct the eye in two dimensions. But in 3D, it kind of backfires because in our world, wherever we look, we see it in focus. So when we present this kind of image in 3D, there's a bit of a disconnect. But the thing we have noticed is we tend to always regard what's presented that's closest to us first, which can really affect the overall composition of an image. Because sometimes we balance a composition like this. If there's a, there a person talking on the left side of the screen and this car was up in the, the lower corner here, in three dimensions, our eye would actually go straight to the car because it's closest to us. I don't know if that's a fight or flight instinct or what it is, but when we're presented with new images and something's close, we tend to regard it immediately. Um, another important set of cues here that we use in 2D to help us with this illusion of depth is this idea of lighting and shadow and what we call the aerial perspective. In this case, I've got a couple of trees. Um, and in this, in this particular image, the tree in the back has a slightly different character to the light, which would potentially be the atmospheric effect. Things in the distance tend to be a little bit bluer because of the filtration of the, the light through the atmosphere. So that would indicate, perhaps, that that tree's farther away. Another cue is what we call the texture gradient. If you look at the leaves in the foreground, they have more texture than the ones in the background. There's more detail, which would indicate that maybe that tree in the, in the, on the right side of the frame is actually farther away. Again, because we're assuming that they both have textures that are identical. Exactly. We're making these assumptions, and we hope they're right. Um, also, the shadows are very prominent on the foreground tree, but in the background tree, we don't actually see it, which might even indicate that it's farther away. But even so, we don't get a, a sense of scale. So in this case, if I add a familiar object to the frame, then suddenly the tree scale starts to make sense to us. And even the distance will start to make sense to us because we have a more familiar object in there. But again, these are 2D cues. In 3D, we get a lot of this for free. Now in this case, this is what we uh, refer to as stereoscopic parallax. So if I'm switching back and forth here between a left view and a right view, you see those images are moving around on the screen. And the, the left side object is moving considerably more than the right side object, which indicates that it has more negative parallax, which indicates 
to me anyway, having done this so much, that that object is in front of the screen. Uh, if I present both images at the same time, you'll see there's a significant amount of parallax on the left side and not on the right side. And I, I call that significant, by the way. It may not look like a lot to you, but it doesn't take much parallax to create an enormous sense of depth. Uh, we were talking about this earlier that uh, stereo photographs of paintings, especially that use very thick paint, it actually, uh, the, the painting looks very, very different in three dimensions to the naked eye than it does in two dimensions because you're now seeing the depth of the actual paint elements, even though it's a very subtle thing. It doesn't take much to be able to do that. One last thing here. When we're talking about uh, creating this illusion of 3D, we have to keep in mind 2D conventions and how some of those may be affected by working in 3D. Focal length is one of them. Uh, when we work in 3D, we tend to favor wider angle lenses because longer lenses tend to compress the depth and we start to lose the depth, although thematically that might be interesting. Framing is an interesting one because as we work in uh, movies, typically you'll notice that a lot of the action happens across the frame because to give the illusion of depth requires either extensive set design or planning that they're usually not willing to do. So in 3D, we actually take into consideration that there is this z-axis to play with. So we tend to use more diagonals in the frame and things to give us this greater illusion of depth. Uh, blocking the action is the same thing. Objects move towards the camera and farther away from the camera don't make as much sense in 2D, but they certainly do in uh, 3D. Camera motion becomes a big one. We work, I've worked with uh, Bob Zemeckis three times now. Um, and he's a filmmaker who's really started to think about 3D to the point where he ends up moving the camera more than he does edit. And one of the conclusions we're coming to now with live performance is as we shoot performances in 3D, the less we cut, the more honest the performance feels. It doesn't feel like we've manufactured it because there's a certain truth to a 3D image that a 2D image would never have because we have to infer a lot in a 2D image. In a 3D image, we're given a lot or, or of Or phrased differently, in a 2D image, a lot of the editing is, is helping you to build Exactly. The space. The conventions we use in editing in films are very important because we call it coverage. When we're shooting a scene, say there's three people talking at a table, we might have one shot that shows all three people. We might then have a two shot of two of them talking and then a reverse angle of the third person. And then we might have what we call singles of each one. The whole point of that exercise is to orient you, the viewer, as to the relationship between the, the characters and the relationship between the characters and their environment. And we need to use these different angles in order to convey that information. A lot of this stuff comes 3D. for free in three yeah. dimensions. Yeah. Huh. And so filmmakers are really starting to rethink this idea of telling stories in 3D.